Good afternoon, everyone. We know electric scarring is possible between planets, but also in the crust of the Earth between plates is also possible to arc. Andy Hall putting out a video explaining the supersonic shock wave accompanying this electrical discharge across plate boundaries or the crust, reflected shock waves. Supersonic jet engines experience the same exact phenomenon. And when I saw this slide in his presentation, I was like, wait a second. I live in East Tennessee. I see that exact same geology. And I had also done a video, the massive habitation, burial mounds of the Cherokee, all underwater through the TVA project. And I wondered why. Well, they go to such lengths to cover everything, including the prehistoric sites and near Chote. I do remember seeing a similar feature and with the wind at a 90 degree of the shock wave, I thought, huh, let me see if I can find any similar geology and not eight miles away from Chote. I saw the first one and I said, well, if there's one, there's probably going to be others. And there sure were instance after instance across the Smoky Mountains going into North Carolina, some more discernible than others. And I started to mark them on a map. And I thought of Chote as the beginning point of the shock wave. Where's the end point around wave 11 clear to the east? And right away, looking for Native American sites, I found Silva, the Judicula Rock. Megalithic petroglyphs, unexplained, lots of myth and legend around it. I am going to decipher this for you to the best of my ability. These were plasma displays witnessed from those people watching that shock wave. Electric sprites, check. Owl eyes in a residence field, check. Torrid plasma stacks, check. Squatterman, check. And here's where it gets strange. These Lichtenburg patterns, electrical discharge, but you notice the center. We can see the same from North Carolina going toward Tennessee. And if you follow that shock wave along, it does connect to yet another branching filament from the same discharge. That electric breakdown pattern between the moving charge Something special happening there at the terminus point. The Cherokee's largest cities and largest burial mounds are in this same area. So are the prehistoric sites in Tennessee. Stretching back 9,000 plus years, stones in a row, burial mounds, star forts, and one of the most archaeological diverse areas in the southeast U.S. And it's all underwater, I think, on purpose. What are they trying to hide? Because these stone caves, quote unquote, are repurposed dolmens. And as we enter this next planetary alignment in October of 2024, that hasn't been seen since 79 AD, almost a 2000 year repeating pattern here in this planetary geometry, the magnetic fields are going to start looping and creating its own separate Taurus magnetic field in the outer solar system, which leaves us only two planets away from Mars and then Earth plus the sun. So something interesting and strange, I do believe, is going to happen. So I've been searching through the past, understanding that Thunderbolts Project has figured this out. Our ancient history, the myths, the legends related to planetary discharge of body-to-body -body in space or crustal release of energy from one continent to another, one plate to another. We're talking something so large that it's really out of the human comprehension level because we've never seen anything this big before. But Andy Hall put out this video explaining how if there were a discharge on our crust, the supersonic ground winds and the updrafts would create a shock wave that would separate particles not only by the weight but the element and push them into different areas with a very noticeable pattern. You're looking for that triangular pattern there. You'll have the material traveling with the shock wave and then rolling up into a certain area here. They call it reflected shock waves. There's an actual science behind it in jet engines. And you get this triangular formation on the flanks of hills, especially if there's something in the way to block that. There's mathematical calculations for this, multiple shock reflections, because it is a science. NASA has an enormous amount of information on it because they're dealing with Mach XYZ and their thrust as well as the military does with jet fighters. So you can see the same anomalies happening in the exhaust at supersonic speeds. Now bring that onto the ground level after a discharge and you start to see the same reflected repeating pattern every single time from Asia to Mexico. These are very precise, but if you look at the bottom right, you'll start to see something that is more in the general 
triangular shape. And this slide right here was a catalyst to make me do this video and explain what I see here in the Smoky Mountains in the Cherahala National Forest, because this exact pattern to the west there is exactly what we have here in East Tennessee. And I'd recently completed a video about all of the flooded Cherokee sites, the largest of the habitations, cities, villages, burial mounds, sacred sites here in Tennessee, all underwater now, all of it including prehistoric sites, but they're all concentrated on this 15 mile stretch of river here. Very interesting, but the burial mounds are the largest. They even have to put navigation buoys because of marine hazard now in several locations that were flooded. Largest Cherokee city, you would never know now it's underwater. All that history deleted. So I use Google Maps to go ahead and try to show areas which now you can see the sandbars and the mud bars of where these Vast habitations were cities, and in there I noticed the exact same thing that Andy Hall had indicated, except at very, very small level, and I thought, well, let me dive in and, and see if I could find something, but when they were cutting through to put the electrical lines, you can see there's a much more ridged contour there beneath the foliage. So this is where my quest started. When I saw this from a 90 degree angle where the shockwave is, then you start to see where that ionized wind and the breakdown patterns forced all of the debris into this electric triangle pattern for a better phrase to use. So then I started to just wide out my view from Chote and sure enough, within eight miles, this ridge here, you can drive right up there. I actually want to go hiking and check this area out. So I had a start point and then I realized these are much larger than the one of the Chote. Okay. That's the second point to think about. But then I found yet another one, very stark, very clean on this. And I thought, oh, there's a hiking trail out there too. I'd really like to go visit that. So I had two points of reference. And then I started to see kind of generally which direction the shock wave was traveling. And then sure enough, as I kept going down that mountain range back and forth a little bit, I found the third one, very clean, very discernible with that pyramidal triangle shape forced up in the ridge valleys there. And then I found another one. And I just started marking them on the map as I went. Because once you see this pattern and you know what you're looking for, you're like, oh, it's here again. And before I really widened back out, I went down to that ground view. And this is what it looks like in some of the pattern areas, almost like pyramids through the mountains there. And then I kept heading to the east, a little bit to the north, and then again, found more of the same residual. And in North Carolina, it seemed to be the most stark and the most well-formed. Over on the Tennessee side, Chote is the termination point for that shock wave coming out and that discharge. That's why I think they put the largest city there. It's a very special energy residence area at the termination point of that discharge. That's why that pattern is really small in comparison to what you see in North Carolina, because North Carolina seems like it got the full brunt and maybe that was where the actual initial impact was for that electrical charge coming in on the crust. So here's what the map looks like after I've plotted all those from Chota, the little Tennessee river area heading east all the way into North Carolina. And I thought, all right, well, if the termination point was at Chota and the prehistoric sites down the river there, I'm wondering where the termination point would be around wave 11. I called it shock wave 11, because according to Annie Hall's research, if the formations are 90 degrees off and they're all in the same direction, all those formations were following the arrows, then obviously the shock wave had come from those parallel lines. It looks like west to east. And I thought, all right, well, what's there? I started to do a little research to see if there were more Native American burial mounds, sites, anything that would have clued me in as to some special energy resonance in the crust that was left over that people found and set up their societies because it was such a special energetic place. It took me just about five minutes or less and I found Judacula Rock. Now I'd seen a couple videos about this in the Giants in North Carolina. Judacula Rock, if you're not familiar with it, prehistoric petroglyphs carved on this massive megalith in the middle of the mountains in North Carolina. Now they say it's undecipherable, but I'm going to decipher it for you tonight because I know exactly what it is. Doing the research here on the electric geology and thank you for the Thunderbolts crew 
for putting out so much information over the years that I've learned. Here's all my research of what I learned from them, plus my own. I'm going to put it right here for you in one succinct package. I want to go through all these petroglyphs here. So if you take them off the stone and you lay them out into sort of a flat formation, you get all these, well, obviously right now, people don't know what they mean because they're looking in the wrong direction. They're not looking in the heavens to see what these would have been as a plasma discharge event. So we'll start off with the easiest one, the lowest hanging fruit here, literally the lowest ones on the bottom there, squatter man. And it would have been this size at least. And if you want to learn more about electric geology and the electric universe and how myths and legends were formed with Saturn and different planets, Thunderbolts Project is where you want to head. So around the world, you're going to see the squatter man everywhere. It is the most basic form of petroglyph across the planet. And here you are. The left has more voltage into it. It's more highly charged. That's why there's extra filament starting to form off of it. And the one on the right there, the, it's a very basic. It's just at the low voltage beginning formation. But you can see how many squatter men are through that rock that's been scribed into the sky formations here. Now, moving on to what looks like centipedes, caterpillars, something nobody knows what it is. Plasma display in the sky is what it is. Toroid fields stacking on top of each other. Now, we can come into a, a laboratory and mimic the exact same thing. These are toroids stacked on top of each other, terminus points. And we'll take a look at the two owl eyes at the bottom in just a second. But what can be replicated in a laboratory to what was seen in the skies, it's a very good match. And it would have been moving, too. It would have looked like a moving centipede or a moving caterpillar. They're everywhere in the world as well. It's, a, it's the second most common after the squatter man. It's this toroid stack. And they are everywhere across the planet, northern and southern hemisphere. So you can go two for two on that pretty easily. Now, the next set of glyphs here are going to be something, you know, with two eyes in it. And most interestingly, when I was doing the Cherokee flooded city research, I came across these caves in Tennessee that have the same exact cave art in the same exact what they call quote unquote prehistoric period, say 9,000 plus years ago. It's the same eye mask. So again, bring it into the simulations, bring it into the laboratory, see what you can create with that. It's a phase state change, meaning the voltage is going higher. So the resonance is going to be moving faster. So that it's going to, the shape's going to change. It's going to become, well, it's going to look like splitting, coming back together, enlarging, looping in on itself. And that's exactly what you see. And I know that's exactly what they saw in the skies and they represented it in these petroglyphs. Now the next one here, Sapphire Star in a Jar. If you want to do any research on Sapphire, this is a, such an amazing project. I think this is going to be the future of energy, at least in some shape or form for our planet here. It's been stifled, though, because there's too much money in the traditional. But when you see these circular patterns with the center dot resonating, that one's easily explained, and I encourage you to go to Sapphire and take a look. And then over into Tennessee as well, the cave art sites, you see the same exact thing. They're showing you the phase state change, and this is carved on the walls, and there was some pigment as well. So as the energy input goes up, you start on the left, and as you add more charge, literally voltage, electricity, and bring and ramp that up, it moves faster because it's excited and it moves faster. Then it starts to change shape and state. And we start to see some of this in the Indian Vedic traditions here. And what do we see in the skies above? The same exact things that are represented in the Judicula stone. I'll circle them for you so you can get a better indication. There's a lot of writing on this rock. But going off the voltage scale here, that is near the top. So imagine how electric the atmosphere was and the sounds that would have been around. So if you hear about giants crashing through the forest and these types of giants throwing massive boulders through the air, that was the electric discharge on the planet. It's described in legend. That's exactly what Judicula was. The giants throwing stones, crashing forests, ripping the earth apart. That was this event. And you see it across the planet. Everywhere shows these same electrified skies. And Judicula stone is such a good one here. I'm going to bring you to the bottom jellyfish. They look like jellyfish. And people say, what are those? Well, those are electric sprites, red sprites. And these are becoming much more intense, 
much, much more intense as we march toward this second magnetic field forming in the outer solar system not seen in the last 2,000 years. So I'm also working on another story right now about the blue jets that were seen from the International Space Station that were punching a hole through the ionosphere, very visible here. So how would you represent that on a two-dimensional surface? I circled it in red. That's exactly what that punch hole is right there. Now, from the ground level, it wouldn't be that visible. So for us, it might look just like a straight up and then a tiny dot up there. But from the space station looking down, it looks very different. So if they were in the space station looking at these events, that glyph would be entirely different. Remember, it's your reference on where this is happening. So with all that said, now that's point A over there. Now here, I'm going to take you into the strangeness here because I really think these are connected in where the Cherokee set up their sacred sites based on the electrical resonance in the crust after this discharge pattern occurred. So Lichtenberg figures. You run a different charge through the substrate in the acrylic and then wham, you add an electric charge and whoosh, electricity captured in a medium. So this is what it looks like when it discharges out through known mediums. And you see when people get hit by lightning, they have that same striation, golf courses all the time. Whatever's hit by lightning leaves a mark like this. So out to the deserts here, when the riverbeds dry out, they leave the same exact pattern. So let's talk again about discharge continentally here. Because, you know, East Tennessee is on a craton, so New Madrid fault. That's kind of the separation point. So if you think about different charges, maybe California plate had a different charge than the one over here, New Madrid fault coming to the east, and then there was a, a differential. But there's something else that charged way above that would have been coming interplanetary, and this would have been just a secondary charge. So these Lichtenberg patterns are very discernible. North Carolina, if you're on the west side of the image here going north, that termination point up there this is the big rivers right now on the Google Earth. So that terminates off toward Tennessee. And then at the bottom, if you follow the discharge pattern in the rocks, then uh, that ionized wind that pushed all the triangle patterns up, those two would have connected across the mountains. The blue that you see right now where the dams are, so it's very easy to see where the rivers are. But the rivers are the discharge canals in those fractal patterns. So like I said, here's where it gets kind of uh, bend your imagination. Think of what you're looking at with the electrical breakdown pattern on the left between the moving charges. How would that have left a different resonance in the crust? That blue arrow points to where that is, and you know what's there? All of those Cherokee cities and villages going down the river. You can see the fractal patterns right here on the map, and the prehistoric sites are there as well. The Star Fort is there all in this tiny little stretch of river that was the connection between that moving charge. And it's really hard for me to believe that people have been there for 9,000 plus years, that there isn't something incredibly special about this small area along the river that seemed to be the connection between those two discharge points going up into the mountains, forming new mountains, and going out, creating that extra build-up ridge pattern further west. Like Rose Island, 7500 BC, people have been living there since then. Archaic period inhabitants, the other area, one of the oldest inhabited areas. I'm going to say even Clovis, this was going on here. Permanent habitation sites. What's most interesting as well is the carved stones that were here. They found 13 stones in a straight line. That has been buried up and underwater, but they didn't know about Adam's calendar back then, but I am saying there's a connection between that, and there has been a rush to bury everything that was the past in this area underwater as quickly as they could. See all those marks off to the left? That's bulldozers scraping over the archaeological site. Yeah, they did some excavations in the early 70s, but this much of a treasure trove of not only the Cherokee, but the prehistoric peoples, the star fort and everything in this area, and they just wanted to put underwater as fast as they could. You can't even go scuba dive on these sites underwater now. They're not very deep. They put buoys there because they don't want your boat to scrape on it. It's a marine hazard, at least the top of it. You can't even get permission to go scuba dive in these areas. What do they not want you to see? That's the thing I want to know. Here's an interesting image of the star fort as well. Bottom is where... Fort Loudon is, 
But if you look a little bit north there, there's some unusual straightness in the river. And then if you go to the very top of the photo in the back, remember when people were selling their land, generally it was the contour of the land that was sold. And notice that star at the very tip up there in the northeast corner of this image. Something strange going on with the geology here as well. we got all the burial mounds that needed to be covered up. And then looking at the satellite view here, yeah, you can see Fort Loudon there on the bottom. But the strange, quote-unquote, natural formation of this all submerged. This is what it looks like now. It's under a lake. And the largest burial mounds in the Cherokee Nation in the east, my local, underwater as well. Such a rush to bury it up. So as we look back onto the wider contour here, I am going to go step out on a limb here and say where that white arrow points to is where the discharge was at the greatest amount of damage and destruction on the crust and a reformation of. And that's what I said, when you get up into North Carolina over toward wave 10, 11, that had the much more defined pattern than it did further down around uh, wave one, two, and three. Although they were very discernible, but the perfection of way, you know, around 10 and 11, those two sites up there. And the Judicula stone, I mean, somebody was in Silva looking up at the sky where this arrow was pointing, seeing that event go on. And we have all this information that something magnificent happened in the past and was witnessed by so many people in this area of the country. The Judicula stone, everywhere from that red dot going west was witnessed, recorded, legends, stories. Cherokee City, Chote, underwater, couldn't keep it. How about Tuskegee? Tumultly, got to be underwater. And you know what, really, I can't believe it that they keep saying these dolmens are cave houses. Go to Europe and look up the word dolmen and see if you see any similarity right here. All they did was put a wooden face on it and moved right in. It's a dolmen. They were hiding from plasma discharge. Again, how many millions of dolmens were there around the planet until they started to deconstruct them use them for roadways or building materials. There's only a couple hundred thousand or under now, but apparently there were more than two and a half million dolmens that were known over the last 200 years, and now we're left with just a very small handful. So if you're hiking in the forest and you come across one of these, please take some images and know that you have a dolmen and ancients were there hiding from the skies. And as we do come into 2024, things are going to get very strange with Electric discharge in our skies, we're already starting to see it. You got white aurora borealis, those electric sprites that I showed you, those are real, those are right now. Those sprites are increasing in intensity and that blue jet lightning, that's all happening now. There's definitely an uptick in electric skies happening as we speak and you listen to this video. Things are going to get real strange and maybe that's why all the distractions happening politically and all these crazy things across the planet to keep you distracted from this event coming back again right now. Will it be at the proportion of this? I don't think so. Will it have an effect on our society and ability to grow food and feed everybody on the planet? Absolutely yes and I think that's what the distraction is all about. And over the last year, a lot of people have been asking me why did I choose East Tennessee of all places in the world to settle up for this grand solar minimum intensification and riding through the next few years of change. Electric geology. A, the soils here can grow an enormous amount of different types of foods. Short winters, but zooming in. Plentiful rivers. The academics will put it at 8,000 years. People have been living here continuously and then wind protected through the different valleys. So if we do get sideline winds of three to 400 miles an hour, depending on the direction it's blowing, if it's not straight up and down valley, should be protected in the dip. And today I was doing a little bit of research on the Cherokee Native American Indian burial mounds, which have been submerged under different dam building projects, looking for clues in repeating cycles of time. I stumbled across this 2005 article new prehistoric cave art found in Tennessee. And I looked and I said, you know what? I have seen all of these shapes before with Anthony Peratt and David Talbot looking into their plasma petroglyphs, plasma geology, Andy Hall talking about sculpting of the earth as well, plasma bolts from the heavens. So taking a look at the three different glyphs here, 
I'm going to start you off with the one on the left. Now, I want you to count one, two, three, four, five, six, and you'll start to see that periphery. It sort of looks something like this that you would find in the skies in an atmosphere so ionized that it's beyond our comprehension. But ancients did see this because when we look at what we can replicate in plasma laboratories onto what has been seen across different rock art features globally, we start to see the same things. And I'll bring you up to the top left there in the sketch art, and you'll count six going across. These are stacked toroids from Europe to North America, Africa, Asia, spotted everywhere prehistory. And then if you count across, you get exactly six in that left petroglyph too. Very interesting how it matches with that. But what I saw the one on the right, it sort of looked like a standing figure, a man with the aura coming off perhaps, unless you realign it to look at something like the eye mask here. Again, something seen through prehistory across all cave art and different petroglyphs across the planet. Now, this is a phase state change indicating an increase in voltage through the plasma medium. You might call it the owl, but notice how it goes from a single concentric circle into doubles and then it starts to really glow and move. There's a better indication here of what you might see if you're gonna take that from a three-dimensional into a two-dimensional form and try to carve it into rock. It, you, know, you have these different variants and forms as it's going through the change of state into something more highly electric. So think about if you or I were to witness in the skies, we would be hiding in caves. We would run for our lives to the deepest cave you could possibly find. But notice something like this where it's curving around a bend. You might be out of the heavy winds and you would able to peer through a very single small section of sky without risking your life, although terrified. So you might only see one half of the owl eyes in transition. So how would you explain this? This is what you get. You're going to get half of the entire change happening in the sky. So I'll let you use your own words. Either or, these are both experiments done in the lab, replicating what the ancients witnessed in the skies and carved for us to remember. Describe this for me in English right now. Describing this to me. Concentric circles where they're morphing and they fold back in on themselves and they create larger loops. And sometimes you see where I'm going with this. So back into the caves here in Tennessee, they start to find something with circles and concentric circles. Now they did some radiocarbon dating, but it was the torch fragments. It wasn't actually the pigment off the walls. So the torch fragments, you have to ask yourself, was it those who survived? Was it those who came after the next generation of survivors? Well, they found two very distinct layers of these torch fragments. The first one, 2,800 years prior, which is about 800 BC. Then we got about 640 years ago, plus or minus 40 years. But in this cave, they found a, an array of these different petroglyph arcs with the varying eyes. And this is exactly what you would expect for somebody trying to put a three-dimensional form onto. And look how that is, that center row there showing you the phase state change. Somebody very observant doing this. And if you put them next to each other, obvious what was going on in these caves. So here on the East Coast in Tennessee was witnessed the same exact phenomenon that was witnessed out West in our country. And at the same time, you would see squatter man, electrified skies, myth and legend that would be carved onto canyon walls for all antiquity. Now here's another one from the 47th unnamed cave. And you look at that and say, huh, I wonder if that's also plasma because very similar across different continents what again can be replicated in any lab. If you just take the halo off before it comes into ultimate voltage ramp up, you would get that circular head along with those same arms protruding off. And notice the hands too, very distinct. Now, as we come into 2024, you're gonna have to ask yourself, are we gonna see something like this in Jupiter as the gas giants line up into their square that hasn't been seen for 2000 years? Are we going to see arcing plasma differentials across continental plates or boundaries, continents? How about the craton? Is it a different charge over on a continental boundary out in California? Is this arcing across the United States? Is this what was seen in some instances? Because I linked everything below in some of the videos that I went over in the Thunderbolts project and the ricotte structure and the electric discharge craters coming out of different kind of arc welds, very similar. And with that same time frame of the seven cycles of 400 years, this grand solar minimum is a reset for society anyway on its 400 year 
time cycle. Seven of those is the 2,800 years with the first carbon dating of the torch, remnants, where we saw the different concentric circles in the caves. But October 2024, these gas giants are going to line up into this square again, not seen since 79 AD. What type of electrical phenomenon would we witness with the sun going into a decreased activity state, the earth in the center, and then a second magnetic field in our solar system? I don't care how minute it is. It's a secondary magnetic field in the solar system as our main generator, the sun, goes into a low activity state. The great architect of the universe, mathematical precision, cycles in time. We're back at it again. I almost feel like I'm looking at elitist hands juggling the planets here. This great reset is by no accident for this time frame. All of the events you're seeing globally happening right now is because of what's coming in 2024, October. Repeating cycles of history, not much you can do to save it except get yourselves ready to grow your own food, store some food, get the water ready, and get ready to ride through this. And during the research, I found this Egyptian hieroglyph scene that I'd never come across before. Energy being funneled into different sources. I wonder if those four Birkeland currents coming off what would be considered the gas giants are funneling into our Earth at the bottom. Let me know what you think in the description box below. Appreciate you watching. Remember, you're going to have to get ready during this time. Those who were prepared always survive these events. Going to start you off here over East Tennessee, Cherokee Nations, prehistoric sites. Originally, every dot that you see here was a massive Cherokee Nation habitation area, burial mounds, sacred areas. It's all underwater now. For an example, Chote, the metropolis discussed in 1765 multi-thousands of people living in this area and size does matter what do you see in the middle of the habitation triangles there but the larger it was the more meaning it had hence burial mound is what you're looking at because of a place of reverence and the size of it meant the power it had in these different villages i'm going to call them even cities because they were Burial mounds is where we're going to go when you start to see these larger drawings on the maps as we go through the video. But here it is now, completely submerged, one of the greatest pieces of our historical past, underwater. And as I zoom in, those of you that understand the electric nature of the sculpting of our Earth, why is it that these scallop patterns are right where one of the power symbols for the great Cherokee nations were. They resonated with the energies. They understood this energy was plasma geology, the elements in the rocks, underwater now. But let's step back into the past. 7,500 BC, that'd be about 9,500 years ago or so. The Little Tennessee River in the watershed, substantial habitation, the site we're going to look at here, the Ice House Bottom Site and the Rose Island Site. Both of these would be absolute, you're arrested if you even pick up a grain of sand off of the place in today's modern world. But both of these sites within a mile of each other, eh, 1970s, put it underwater, didn't even matter. This is one of the excavation photos. And also what they'd found is the way these rocks were lined up in different areas, there were 13 different square stones lined up in a perfect line going toward the solstice. So again, Adam's calendar in Tennessee, something that old going back 9,500 years as a celestial calendar, bury it in the water. You know, we wouldn't want anybody to see this now submerged. You can't even get a permit to go scuba diving to see these ruins and to see the mounds underwater. That's how protected it is now. But, oh, to build a dam over it so we can't look at it. Oh, that's okay. They call it the Archaic Period. And these specific sites right now are the oldest known semi-permanent habitations, not only within Tennessee, but the Southeast U.S. But they're all underwater. Why is that? 
Did they not know, the planners of the TVA and these different dams, that this would be off limits for any archaeologists? And Rose Island, yet another. 6,000 B.C., what does that take, 8,000 years ago? Underwater. But I want to bring you over to the Star Forts because the Star Fort is in the exact same area as these two prehistoric sites, yet the largest Cherokee burial mounds as well. All within the same square mile of each other. A little bit strange, a little bit hard to believe that something wasn't being covered up here. Let's jump over. Tennessee Historical Quarterly. The archaeological dig up at Fort Loudoun really started in the 1950s, but we're looking here, 1970s, as the bulldozers had run around scraping everything. What they did catalog was a bunch of stuff from the 1700s. But what happened with the disconnect between the 6000 BC era up to 1700, and all they could find was something from 1700? Yeah, right. Those sites stretch from the Rose Island all the way down to Ice Bottom, completely through this area, square miles of habitation for thousands of thousands of years. Yet they could only find belt buckles from the 1700s. I don't think we're being given the true history of this area. So from the aerial view here, what they've done is they scraped the entire area of all the archaeological evidence, mounded it into this mound here, rebuilt a fake Fort Loudon above where the water line was going to be. And what I want to point you to is across the river. Because notice the very straight edges on this that, well, if you formed it out, would turn into a star. And notice the straight edge going back north toward the bridges. And when I talk about resculpting the landscape, I mean resculpting it. So when you're looking at the fort, which you can easily see with the white edges around it, everything at the bottom, which was the archaeological site, that's all bulldozer marks that they pushed land up. How much did they destroy? But when you look across the river, which had the straight edges, now it doesn't. Magic. But that's where they reconstructed the Teleco blockhouse. And what do I mean, Teleco Blockhouse? This is what you see today, and you're like, wow, look at the ruins there. They're right on the river's edge. That must have been such a great fort, Teleco Blockhouse, all to keep all the soldiers there. Cool. Wrong place. Let's look back into the 1950s aerial photo here, and I want to show you something interesting. Not only are there a lot of straight edges along this river, but if we look where the original Teleco Blockhouse was, check out those perfect straight edges. That does not occur in nature. And this is well before they sculpted any of the riverbank. And MR-23, that's the Ice House bottom site, 7500 BC site. So it would make sense if there was habitation in a prior civilization and society, and star forts were part of that, that some of the oldest things you would ever find would be next to a star fort, which is right exactly what you're looking at, but across the river is a star fort. Wow, imagine that. Coincidental in history, I must say. I'm going to bring you here to the 1970s photos. Now you can see lower part of the image here. That is the Fort Loudon where they had already raised it so it wouldn't be submerged as they flooded everything. But look across the river. Circle there is, your guess is as good as mine. That's not the reconstruction for the Teleco blockhouse. That is something different that was there. And once you start to take a look at these edges, I put the first edge above that circle and I just took it straight down. I didn't even turn it, curve it or anything and look at the exact match on that. So if you were into engineering and you were going to try to create something that was in different multi-levels of a star fort, you need the exact same angle at different heights. That's what we're seeing here. And somehow it was given authority to come in and reconstruct the entire area. Coincidental, would you say? Because looking at today's Google Maps, you can see the Star Fort, Fort Loudon, reconstructed above the waterline. But when you look at the Teleco Blockhouse directly across there, it's very difficult to hide that even though it's above the waterline. So I started to put a few lines in based on what I'd seen and known where the earlier river bottom was, based on the Star Forts that we've seen across the planet. This seems to be a major, massive star fort because the Cherokee found it so sacred that they put two of their largest burial mounds in the same area. Some of the oldest habitation on our planet stretching 
three times further back than the Egyptians in the same area with two habitations within a single mile. I really am baffled at the sheer lack of understanding where they would flood all of this history in a single go. And stepping out into just putting a line wherever I saw a straight area. I know it doesn't exactly match the star for, but resculpt the riverbank there through the last 40 years. And even if you come to the right past where those two uh, docks are in the bay there, going up the river, there's even more straight edges that make no sense, but they actually look like stars. When you start to see those flaring edges out, I'll bring you into a close in here. But you know the Teleco Blockhouse, that square thing is not where originally it was. That was up on the hill and I'd shown you those straight lines before. Something is very amiss here. Because coming into the Fort Loudon, this is from the 1765 map, going right across the river, you know, you see those two gigantic representations of habitation. And remember, size does matter in these maps. Look at the rest of these from Tumultly, and you see the one giant earth mound there, and you go across the river, and those are noticeably larger than anything in Tuskegee as well. Noticeable and earth mound, sacred, but now underwater. My local, that's where one of the largest burial mounds in the Cherokee nations are, underwater. I linked everything in the description box below so you can chase down every single coordinate, look up every single burial mound, look up all the history that's been erased from not yours, but their histories as well. All of our history. This is ridiculous how this was given a go ahead to do such a thing. And to pull out these into a granular form on the left side of the river bank or the west side, Rose Island, at least 6,000 year old ruins. Ice Bottom House, MR-23, 7,500 BC ruins. Fort Loudon, that star fort right in the middle and across the way, bordering on what looks like a deconstructed star fort, the Patrick ruins. Now, you're telling me that all this is in the same exact area here. And it was all flooded. This is one of the greatest archaeological finds in human history, and it's been flooded. All underwater, no need to see it. Maybe there's something more here that was happening that would give keys to our past. Because we know how the Vatican hides treasures, the Smithsonian, National Geographic only allow you the narrative that you're supposed to see and know. This map, everywhere you see an arrow, is an underwater site that would shed light on our previous history. But this is looking the other direction, back into the mountains from the same ice house site. Fort Loudon would be just off to the bottom of the screen there. But as far as you can see, would have been habitation, villages, trading posts, cities, burial mounds, sacred sites of the Cherokee Nation. All submerged. All of it. So how large was this burial mound in Tumultly? Something larger than this. Apparently it's about 45 to 47 feet where it needs a hazard marker in the middle of the water area because it's so large and it actually sticks above. That's how large it was. Another burial mound underwater here, Tokwa. You can't even swim out there. This is several miles across and up to Sitico. Massive habitation there as well. And what do you see square in the center? Obviously another burial mound of large, large size. Bring it to today. You could see where it was, but now it's completely submerged. Almost looks like an estuary coming out of something in Louisiana going down the Gulf Coast. You have to realize the riverbeds were very different. They did flood during every single flood season, but the way it's flooded now, it's permanently flooded and all of our history has been erased. So looking over at Tansai, what do you see of the great Cherokee nation? Chote. I'll bring you back to where I started in the beginning here because those are in the same areas. Obviously giant burial mounds there. One of the largest air, they call it the metropolis. Timberlake called it the metropolis in 1765. That's how many people were there. As you came out of the mountains, 
from the North Carolina side, you come into these massive trading areas. Unicoi Highway was another one. But what I found so interesting here, what's that other star for it on the other side? I look for it in vain. History books, libraries, Google Earth, because I'm a fan of this stuff and I really want to visit these areas because I think there's something energetic in this spot. I did talk to a couple of historians and they said it was burned and that was it and it disappeared from history. But we'll never know exactly, but I will bring you to the north and west of the Chota site where it shows the fort was. Do you notice that strange canal that's been dug in there? That's not natural at all, but that's exactly where that fort sits or used to sit. Destroyed in the 1750s, but I guess that's a conversation for another day. Underwater still, nonetheless, off limits for everybody. And look at the massive amount of destruction of all these archaeological sites, from the Cherokee Nations to the Star Forts. And it does seem flooding, whether natural or man-made, covers all remnants of history. This lithograph here, from either rising sea levels or sinking earth from the Ottoman Dominions, 1860s as well. I do thank you for watching. So much of our history has been erased and I try to uncover parts of it. You can join me over at Patreon forward slash adapt 2030. The 1700s 